Hi, my name is Justin Shelf, and I'm the engineering lead at PatchMyPC. We develop a third-party patch management solution that integrates into Microsoft Configuration Manager. Prior to my current role, I was also a premier field engineer at Microsoft supporting Config Manager. It's been about three weeks since my last video, a little longer than average, uh, because me, myself and some of my team were on a user group tour in Sweden, Norway, and Estonia talking about third-party patching and Config Manager. We got to meet some of our customers internationally. Uh, just a great event. David James, the director of uh, engineering for Config Manager, was also there. So we had some great community insight, uh, some things that the product group is doing, and just overall an awesome event. So that's why it's been a little delayed compared to my average cadence that I was kind of on previously. But in this video, we are going to be talking about content in Config Manager. So uh, I, I posted a poll out on Twitter and I asked what the next topic should be. And the winner was content lookups and deep dives in Config Manager. So what I'm gonna be covering today is how content is stored on your site servers within the content library, how the distribution of content works to remote DPs, and then how clients do their lookups. And more importantly, how we can troubleshoot uh, issues when clients get the content not found error to understand the flow that happens there and why that might occur. So with that said, I will go ahead and jump right in. This is a pretty complex topic. I'm going to try to present it in a way that hopefully makes sense and provides you guys value. Uh, but the first thing that I want to look at is whenever you add a new application or package or download a software update into Config Manager, uh, it goes into this thing called the content library on your site server. So the content library, it's a single instance storage uh, for any content that you add to Config Manager. So what that lets you do is that if you reference the same files through multiple packages, Config Manager only needs to store that once. But in order to make that work, uh, there, there's a few different things within the file structure that has to happen within that content library for things to work. So th there's three different concepts here for the content library. We have what's called the package library, the data library, and then the file library. So the package library contains information about what packages are present on a distribution point. So if you uh, targeted a package and the content to a remote DP, that will contain information about any packages uh, that are on that DP. The uh, data library contains information about the original structure of files within content. So for example, um, uh, if it's an MSI file, whether there are any uh, additional files within the package source folder or the application source folder, uh, et cetera. And those files are an, an INI file. And what that, that file points to is the actual hash of the actual original files uh, within the file library folder that we see here. Uh, so this is where most of the content's going to exist. This will actually be wh where the uh, files like an MSI, for example, would live in that file library and it would get renamed to whatever the hash of the binary is. Uh, so that's how it can reference the files from the data library and package library folder and then translate them into what the actual content is that needs to be downloaded that exists in the file library folder. And hopefully to make this uh, make more sense of this, we'll kind of review the structure within here. Um, but there is a nice diagram. I'll be sure to include these docs uh, so you can quickly jump out and kind of have a good view of what this looks like. So to make more sense of this structure, what I'm going to do on my console is we're going to go look at an application for 7-zip and we're going to look at the deployment types. So the deployment type is where the actual content exists for different uh, deployment uh, things that we have within an application. So for example, for 7-zip, we can see that we have two different deployment types that are MSI files we can see that we have the 32 and 64 bit for that deployment. But what I'm interested here and what we're gonna show you in the uh, file library and the, um, the package library is what, how we find content and how that translates into the content library. So we have a uh, content that ends in five or seven, five, six, and then four to nine. So this is for the 32-bit uh, MSI and the 64-bit MSI. So on my site server, if we go and look at where my content library exists, so for me, it's on the J drive, and then within the content library folder, we can see those three different structures uh, for folders that we kind of looked at online. So what we're gonna be interested in looking at is that data library folder 
And what we're going to do is go out and say, hey, let's go look for the one that ends in 756. So if we come here and look at this, the one that ends in 756, now we can see that this one does have a period at the end. That's just the revision number for that content, and it's just uh, the first revision. But if we actually look in here, this is going to be in the data library where the INI folders that exist for the structure of the way the package looks. Now within this INI, this is what's going to point out to the actual file hash that's going to live within the file library. Now, the first thing we want to look at here is the first three or the first four um, characters of this file hash. So if we were to copy those four, and if we were to go back and look at the file library, we can see that all the files start with the first four characters of the hash of the actual binary. So in our case, it's the MSI file. So if we were to come in here and do backslash and paste in those four characters for the hash and click enter, this is where we can actually see the files that exist within that MSI. So the hash file, this is going to be the actual file that is the MSI, so this hash. The INI is gonna contain what packages uh, this file is a part of, and then there's just a signature file. So if we were to zoom out on that and look at the INI, that's gonna show us, hey, this is part of the deployment type for this content that ends in 756. But if we actually were to copy this hash file, and let's just paste that to my desktop. And if we go and rename this to .msi, what we'll be able to see is this is actually the original MSI file that was used for 7-zip. So if I go ahead and run this, we can see that, hey, this is just that MSI. We could go through and install this, but this is how the content gets stored within the content library, just to have a general understanding to, to make sense of what this actually does and how they obtain that single instance for files. All right, so I think the next thing I wanna look at is understanding how the content gets distributed from your content library on your site server. So like I mentioned, any package or thing that you add goes into the content library on the site server. Even if that site server is not a distribution point, it's still gonna live on that uh, site server uh, within, your, within your environment. But when you start adding remote distribution points, the content is gonna transfer from your site server's content library to that remote distribution points content library. So uh, if we come here and look at my current site systems, we can see that we have my site server, that's named SCUP, but we can also see that we have this remote distribution point called SCCMDP. Um, so in order to uh, make sure that we have some content and show you how the content gets distributed, I'm gonna go into this Java package and choose to distribute content. So I'm gonna go ahead and walk through the wizard and I'm gonna point out to that remote distribution point uh, for that content. And I wanna go through and show how we could troubleshoot any type of content distribution issues that you might experience while distributing content. So if I open up CMTrace and go to the log files of my site server, we want to look at two log files. The first one's going to be our dist manager.log. So that's our distribution manager log. So we're going to add that one. And then there's going to be a package x. Let me see if I can find that package x x for manager.log. And I'm going to choose this option down here to merge both of these files. So whenever you go out and you distribute content to a remote DP, uh, the distribution manager and the package uh, X manager is going to be what actually transfers the content from your primary site server's content library into the content library of that remote distribution point. So we'll just wait for a minute while that process completes. All right, so within our log file, we can see that as part of the package X for manager log, we can actually see it sending the file. So for example, here's one of the files that got sent to that remote distribution point that we see here. Um, so looking at the log, we can see it. We can see the original MSI file name here that was being added to that remote server. Um, so if you ever had issues with content going out to remote DPs, like for example, if you came in here and it was stuck like in this pending state and you just couldn't see anything, those two logs would be a good place to start. So if we refresh, we can now see that that is out on our remote distribution point. So uh, for this, we have 7-zip deployed to a client. So we have that deployed to a collection. And we also have a 
software update group for some third-party updates also targeted to a collection. So when a client actually requests for content of a deployment, the first thing that you need to have a basic understanding is boundaries. Uh, so boundaries are how clients determine where to get content. So there's this, uh, and I do talk about this more in my second video covering some of the basic uh, post installation steps. So that would be a good place to look to if you want more detail about boundaries and boundary groups. But essentially what a boundary is, is it's a network location of your clients. So whenever clients are gonna request content, the, the first thing the client's gonna do is, hey, am I part of a boundary group that contains a boundary that I'm located in. So if I look at my boundary groups, that's how we actually assign distribution points to different boundaries as part of this group. So for example, if I look at this boundary group, we can see that I added that boundary that contains uh, 192.168.1.0 through uh, 1.20 as an IP range. So any clients within that range would be pointing to this uh, boundary group and within this boundary group is where on, under the references, you would, you would determine what distribution points clients sh should use as part of this boundary group. So this is pointing to that SCCMDP that we distributed our 7-zip and Java package to. So if I jump over to a client, I wanna talk about how requests are made. So here's the two, or here's the 7-zip application that I've deployed. Now, this one, if we look at our IP address here, so IP config, we can currently see that our IP is 1.24. So that means that it would not fall within that boundary of 1.0 to 1.20. So if we went ahead and tried to install this, what we're gonna see is we get a content not found error. So if we look at the error code, we can go ahead and grab that. And then if I open up CM Trace, let's see that. There we go. And do a control L, we can look up that error code. And if we actually look at that error code, that's where you can see that, hey, the content for 7-zip could not be located on any distribution points. So uh, if we actually want to look at this at the log level, if we break out to our logs for our client, so C Windows, CCM logs, under the content access log, which is going to be that CAS.log. This will contain any location request for content. So if I were to uh, go ahead and open this log file, what you're gonna see is the attempt to download content for that package, and we can see that zero distribution points were found. So that's why we got the content not found. So when the client requests content, it's gonna make the request up to your management point. So if I come back to my site server that also has my management point running, and if I look at my log files for my management point, so under SMS underscore CCM in my case, under the logs, this is where you can actually see the location request coming in from your client. So if we look at the MP location log, this is where the client sends the request and this is the log file on the server side that comes up to our management point that shows information about all our content requests. So for example, we can see that within this log file, it, it's giving us the client IP address, right? It's giving us the AD site name that the client is in, giving us the forest name, the domain name, et cetera. And the, the management point is going to be what actually reaches out to the database to determine whether this client is part of any boundaries and whether any distribution points within those boundaries and boundary groups contains the content that the client is looking for. So at a deep level, if you actually wanna know what stored procedure the management point is doing to look up content, I can actually show you what that would look like. So if I open up uh, SQL Management Studio, and if we look at our database and look under our Config Manager database, under the programmability, we're gonna have different stored procedures that functions use and things do within, um, within Config Manager. So the management point has a lot of different stored procedures that it does when it looks up information uh, on, the, on requests it gets from clients, for example. So some of the stored procedures that happen for content lookups are uh, MP underscore get content location, 
Um, so for example, if we look at uh, two of these stored procedures, we have the get content DP info. So this is what the management point, when it gets the parameters from the client, like what network IP subnet, what IP, what AD site, it's then gonna run different stored procedures to determine whether there are any boundary groups for that client and whether any of the distribution points within those boundary groups actually contain the content that the uh, client is requesting. So the protected would be if you are not allowing fallback uh, for your deployment. So that would say this, this could only work if the content is in the boundary group that a client is located in. The unprotected, that means that the client could also fall back to like the site uh, content boundary group, and it could go to a remote distribution point, for example. So at, at, at the background, the stored procedure runs, we can see the different parameters uh, that the client would pass to that, and that's gonna determine whether there are actually any distribution points that contain that content. So that's gonna run against the database to see if that package exists. So that looks good. There's a few other stored procedures that we can see that are also getting run here. Um, but I, I think the key point is here, if you were troubleshooting content, you'd make sure that you see the request coming in under the MP location, and then that would help you verify that the client has connectivity. And then if the content's not found, we have to start understanding whether it's because the distribution might have failed for the package or application, or whether the boundary might not exist or whether there's some other th action that we would have to troubleshoot to determine if there's some other cause for that content not being found. So for our case, this one should be pretty easy to understand. So since that uh, client is part of 1.24 for the IP range, and if we look back in our boundaries, we can see that the uh, boundary that that group is in only goes up to 1.20. So uh, the the distribution point that we put that content on is not part of a boundary group that that client is actually requesting from. Um, so that would make sense why the content wasn't found. Um, so there's a few different scenarios here. Uh, one might be, do you wanna allow the clients to be able to fall back to other distribution points if it's not on a local one or maybe the client's not part of a boundary that you've configured in Config Manager? So within applications, the way the fallback works is within each deployment type under the content tab, you're gonna have two different options here, whether you wanna allow clients to fall back and then uh, whether you wanna allow them to fall back to the default site boundary. Um, so I'm gonna allow them to fall back to the default site as well as any neighboring boundaries that the content might exist in that could be associated with their boundary group. So I'm gonna do that for the 32-bit MSI as well as the 64-bit MSI here. So now if we come back to our client and look at our content, if we go ahead and retry this, now that we're allowing fallback, we'll see what happens here. All right, so now we can see that the client successfully downloaded the content. So if we look at our CAS log, we can see that when that request came in, we did find a matching distribution point and we downloaded that content and it installed that package. Now, one thing I do wanna cover is that when you allow fallback, you also need to make sure that the distribution point you wanna allow clients to fall back to is part of the fallback default boundary group. So within here, under the references of my default site boundary, I assign that distribution point to be a distribution point that we enable for fallback. Now within that, there's also some behavior here. So uh, the default value is do not allow fallback until the client could not found the content from a distribution point in its own boundary for up to 120 minutes. Just for this lab, I made it one just so the process would be faster when it times out and says, let's allow that fallback now that we enable that option within our deployment type of our application. So that is the fallback method that allows you to go to the default site boundary. You would just need to make sure that you have whatever distribution point you wanna be your fallback source. So usually this might be a centrally connected location if you're in a large hierarchy uh, to be kind of the site uh, fallback. Now there is another option that, would, that the client would prefer before the site boundary, and that's if there are any references to the boundary group that that client is in 
for other boundary groups uh, within there. So under this relationships tab, this is where you can specify a fallback relationship with another boundary group. So for example, let's say you had two remote locations that might be closer to each other and better connected than falling back to the main site server one. So in that scenario, you might wanna have the fallback relationship set for those two different locations and those two groups so they could fall back to each other. And this type of relationship would happen as a priority before the main site boundary for falling back. So I'll also include some references to the, the default uh, priority. So here's where we can see the default one would be a distribution point on the same subnet, then within the same boundary, then uh, within the current boundary, and then here's the fallback relationship. And then finally, the next location that the client would look for is the default site boundary, which is what we just saw happen. So that looks good. Um, we go ahead and zoom out of that. Now, looking back under my software update, so if I come back to my client and look in Software Center, I do have some third-party updates. So just like clients would request content for packages or applications, your uh, distribution packages for updates will also exist on your uh, distribution point. So for example, if I look at my deployment package, we can see that this has been distributed to my SCCMDP and it's already out there. Now, the way that you allow fallback for software updates are a little bit different. So let's go ahead and request this Google Chrome update. So for this one, we can see that it's kind of stuck at installing. And if we come back to the main updates view, we can see that it's stuck at this dreaded downloading 0% phase. Um, so since this content is not part of our client's boundary group, it's just gonna sit here and keep on doing requests uh, that essentially say that we couldn't find any distribution points for that content. So the way that you allow fallback for the software updates is a little different. So um, if we look back in our software update groups, you don't do this per update like you would do with an application's deployment type to, to allow to fall back to your site boundary or even a fallback relationship. This is done per software update group deployment. So if we look at the deployment tab here and look at the download settings, this is where you can determine whether or not you wanna allow your clients to fall back to a neighboring boundary that's part of a relationship or even the default site boundary in order to download updates if that client is not part of a boundary group or if the content hasn't got to a distribution point within that client's boundary group. So if we wanted to go ahead and enable the fallback and go ahead and choose yes, if we come back to our client, let me just see if we can cancel this update. All right, looks like that was canceled. Um, and then if we go ahead and try again, what we should see is after about a minute, because that's what we set our fallback timeout to be, we should see this download complete. So it looks like our Java update actually kicked off and already downloaded a bit before. So we can see that that one looks like it's installing now. Uh, if we look at the cache folder now that that fallback was enabled, if we come over here to CCM cache, we can see the folder that the Java update got downloaded to. So there we are. And here in any, any minute here, we should see that we go from Java 8 update 161 to 191. Um, and finally, to jump back on Chrome, it looks like uh, it's not fully kicked off yet. Let's go and show the scenario of us actually changing the boundary group and boundary for it to match that IP range that it's in. So let's go ahead and extend that so it goes up to 1.25 so that that client's now part of the boundary group. So it looks like that patch might have already kicked off before uh, we actually came back in and went ahead and installed from the fallback point. Um, so that looks good. So that's how software updates would play if they're, if they're allowing fallback. You would have to do that from the actual deployment within that software update group. Now let's go ahead and uninstall Java. And we'll go ahead and do the app deployment. So now that this uh, uh, client is part of a valid boundary group that is in the 
uh, distribution point associated to it, if we come back into our applications and actually deploy Java, and if we look at the deployment types for the 64-bit, we can see that we don't have that fallback setting enabled. Um, but that should work fine because this is now part of a valid boundary. So this is how most scenarios should probably work. You should probably try to make sure that you have uh, boundaries configured for all your client locations. Uh, most of the time, you probably won't, won't want to allow a lot of fallback. There might be some places where clients aren't in a boundary that you would want to allow fallback. But ideally, I think if you can get a distribution point and boundary group, you would want to make sure those clients are assigned uh, to one of those groups. So I'm going to go ahead and target a application deployment to this client that does not have fallback enabled. But now that we actually configured our boundary correctly, and this client that is 1.24 should fall within that range, it should still download and install Java as an application just fine. So I'll go ahead and do policy just to have this check in a little faster. All right, so the policy kicked in and we can now see Java showing as applicable now that we uninstalled the update, so it's no longer there. So if we go ahead and request this and look at our CAS log, things should just work in this scenario because we have our content distributed to a boundary that is part of that boundary group. So if we go ahead and do install, we can see that it went ahead and copied that content and did everything successfully. So if we actually look at that path that was copied, we should be able to actually browse out here since our distribution point is not in HTTPS. So if we actually copy this and open a web browser, we can actually see the source file from IIS that we're actually pulling here. So for example, if we were to click this, this could actually be, this is actually the web service that Bits is using when it actually downloads that MSI file. So at the distribution point level, if we were to actually go into our DP and open up IIS, this is where we're actually going to see the web service within IIS actually translate all that content into our actual content library on our distribution point. So if we look under our default website, these are where our packages actually live. So if we go ahead and look at that, here's the different folder structure that is being pointed to on our clients. So for example, if we open up that file live folder and explore, we can see that this is pointing out to our content library that for this remote distribution point is part of our D drive. So for example, if we come here and look at that Java update, we can see that the first four characters of the hash let me go find that. So if we come back to our site server and we look at our application for Java and we look at our 64-bit, we can see that the content ends in C7CA. So if we come back to our distribution point and look at our data library and we look for c 7 CA. Here's the actual INI file, and this is where it's pointing out to that hash. So if we copy the first four characters of that and go look at the actual file lib, and we go into that first four characters of the hash, this is where the actual MSI file exists. So when that request is being made from your clients to pull that MSI, IAS on the back end is sending you this file and then just renaming it to the MSI during the actual download path but this is how it's pulling that download through IIS and bits from the client side. All right, so I think that's most of what I had. The last tool that I'll show you is a tool that comes in Config Manager. If you look under your installation directory on your site server, under the Tools folder and Server Tools, there's this tool called the Content Library Explorer. So this can be used to allow you to connect to a remote distribution point so in our case, we're gonna choose that SCCM DP. And this will essentially connect into the content library and it will give you a name of all the package that exists on that distribution point. So for example, here's our 7-zip and Java package. But if you actually expand that, it's gonna show you all the different content 
within that. So we can see our two different deployment types and it's gonna tell you where the file is. So we can see that this is our actual file name from the core package, our MSI. We'll see the size of it, what drive that it lists on. And then uh, more interestingly, we we'll see where that actual file corresponds with the hash and where it actually lives within the file library folder. Um, so just a helpful tool to troubleshoot if you're maybe having download errors, but you think content's there to connect into your remote DPs and actually look if all the files actually exist within that path as a troubleshooting me method. One of the other common things that sometimes happen in task sequences is if a, a client is using an AD site boundary, but it's part of a work group, sometimes the content lookups don't translate to see that it's within a boundary that actually exists. So if you didn't have the fallback enabled on each of your deployment types, it's pretty common for applications to just not get installed during a task sequence, depending on what boundaries that the clients are a part of and whether it can resolve them if they're part of a work group, for example. But that's all I have. Uh, I hope the video was helpful. Uh, in the accompanying blog post, I am gonna include a lot of different resources for the docs website. Um, there are a lot of moving parts here and I, I know I didn't cover everything, but I think this should hopefully give a good idea of the way that content stored, how it's distributed, the method that your clients use to do the lookups and what logs involved in the client and the server side, as well as uh, some concepts like fallback in case clients aren't part of a boundary that can be a common issue of why you might get waiting for content or things might not ever happen from a client side. If you have any questions, leave them in the video post or the accompanying blog post. And thank you for watching.